Um, scores the best on that. We'll get uh, a, a guest appearance by Perry for um, uh, one day, one race. Who gets to make up the questions? And second place is the whole weekend. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Please welcome. Thanks, sir. Hey, Mike. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. How close does this need to be? So, yeah, I'm, um, I'm an old guy. Turned 65 last summer. I should have been retired. Some of you were at my non-retirement party. Uh, the company uh, celebrated my 40 years of service last summer. And um, I started sailing as a kid uh, with my family uh, in Chicago. And in fact, i uh, got a couple pictures. My, my dad, the nuclear physicist, actually designed and built his own 35 footer to start with. Uh, he's on the left and my mom's on the right and the other guy writing an article or interviewing her or something there. So that was, uh, but unfortunately I never got to sail on this. They sold it before uh, I was about five years old and so I don't remember it. But then um, when I was seven, uh, my dad bought a used S uh, Sparkman and Stevens 40 footer. It was an old classic. It actually had won its class in the Mac. Uh, before he bought it, he wasn't a racer. But when I was, you know, he, he being a, uh, a government employee, a senior scientist at Argonne Lab, he got, of course, seven weeks vacation, thanks to the government. So uh, we all piled in the boat and sailed away for weeks on end. And uh, had some fun. So there it is in, in, uh, in Monroe Street Harbor. And then I didn't start, uh, yeah. <laughs> When he sold it, um, somebody decided it would look better yellow. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, when I um, I went to school in Chicago at the U of C and got a math degree, I had no idea what to do with myself when I got out of school, and totally by accident, within two weeks, I stumbled into a job which I was fair to say unqualified for uh, as a captain on an old 12 meter old America's Cup boat done while in heritage. And one thing led to another, and I lived and worked on boats for about three years in a variety of venues. And the last couple of boats had north sails, and the guys asked if I wanted to try sail making, and I said, hmm, okay. And uh, here I am, 40 years later, never did anything different. So I consider myself pretty lucky. I'm not a wealthy guy, but I'm surprisingly comfortable, and I've had a lot of fun. I, you know, I enjoy going to work. I look forward to going to work every morning. And I look forward to going to work every evening, or going home every evening, and uh, so anyway, it's all good. Um, North Sales, when I first started, was already doing uh, North U courses, and we have had a sort of an educational arm of the company all that time. We still do North U courses. Um, they used to be a lot different than they are now. We used to, we used to be experts at the overhead projector. <laughs> and um, let's see, I know uh, we used to start by asking a lot of questions. Uh, so I understand there's a variety of sailing backgrounds here. So how many of you are racing in the spinnaker class? A decent number. And of you guys, uh, I think you're all fairly experienced. Do you, have you, how many of you have done like 10 Mac races? Most of you guys. So most of the Spinnaker group is a pretty veteran group that knows what's going on. Um, so how many of you are doing the, the new um, the Vic, uh, Cruiser class, which I assume is not that many? You guys are too bashful. Really? Okay. So, and just so I understand, that's non-Spinnaker? Right. And are the courses typically not Hoover lured? There's a lot of reach out, reach back kind of thing, or not? Yes? Okay. So 40 years ago when uh, I was doing these North Views with Jerry Gavin, some of you will remember Jerry Gavin, he used to, we used to ask all these questions and then he would always end with another question. He goes, how many of you guys have, and gals, have uh, engineering or science background? Well, it's always about a third or a quarter. And then he would say, well, you know, that's too bad, <laughs> but in spite of that, you might still learn to be decent sailors. <laughs> and it's a joke, but it's not a joke. That um, the science of how sales work is frankly not very useful. Understanding it is really not very useful. And I will, we'll talk about some basic principles, but I don't pretend to be a 
scientist myself, and um, it, it, the, the real world has got so many variables, and so much of what we do to so fast is just by feel, and, uh, and it's sort of an instinctive response, basically, that uh, the science, it, it, you basically can get hung up on the science and, and not have it not help you, anyway. Um, we could talk about a lot of different subjects. Um, we sort of selected, I, I think it was Herb's decision here, I don't know, but we selected upwind sail trim as the focus of this. But we don't have to do that if you want to do, like if the cruising class does a lot of reaching, we might talk about something different there. Maybe I'll finish up with this and get back to that if, if there's enough interest in that. Um, I'm sure all of you sail sloop rigs. There aren't any catches or schooners or whatever here. So we have two sails. And uh, to start out with, the two sails affect each other. So we do not trim them the same. And we don't have the same goals for the two sails. And so we'll start out with the Hensel because that's when you're going upwind, that's what the wind sees first. And the Hensel does something to the wind and makes a different environment for the mainsail behind it. And that is actually, sounds corny, but it's pretty important and shouldn't, shouldn't be forgotten. So most of you that have, for sure all of you that have a masthead boat, how many have masthead boats with a big 150 demo? I'm guessing, and again, you're too bashful. How many have only a, a fractional rig, meaning the head stay doesn't go all the way to the top and have a non-overlapping jib, you know, 100% jib? So, a fair amount, okay. Well, again, the, the balance of power on the rig is quite a bit different. And if you do have the old style masthead 150% Genoa, basically 80% of your boat speed upwind is derived from the head stay. Why is that? Square feet. Because it's just plain bigger than the mainsail. But there's another really important reason. And that is, do you know the geometry here? Somebody, you guys got to know this. The main, typically when you go upwind, the boom is near the middle of the boat, right? You got the main trimmed in pretty hard. The Genoa was never trimmed on the center line. Your track is, most of your cruising boats, the track is 10 degrees off center line. So the Hensel is trimmed quite a bit outboard, we say. So the angle is different. And why is that important? Here we go with the science. The, basically, when there's flow across the sail, the lifting force is more or less at right angles to the surface of the sail. So that the further out the sail is from the center line of the boat, the direction of pull is more and more beneficial. More of the pull is forward and less sideways. When we trim our main boom on the center line, where is it pulling? Straight sideways. Does that help the boat go fast? Well, it does, but we'll see why later. Okay, so for those of you with a 150% masthead Genoa, again, that sail is 80, 80 or 90% of your speed factor upwind. For those of you with the different rigs, then it's a better, it's more of a balance between the two sails, and both sails contribute a fair amount. <clears throat> okay, so we'll just start out with the real basics here. Um, what are all the things you can do to make your Hetzel different? Either more powerful or less powerful, or tip you over more, or tip you over less, or help you point higher, or help you aim faster, whatever. Whatever the whole lot of variables, right? right? Yeah. So, what's the most important adjustment you have with the sail? The sheet. So we start out with, and typically when you sail upwind on a race, you don't ever cleat the sheet. Typically, have, you're playing it most of the time, unless the wind is absolutely steady, then you don't need to worry about it. But typically, you know, in the real world, uh, there's dynamic stuff happening, and there's waves, and there's puffs, and there's shifts, and uh, so we're constantly moving the sheet in and out. Why would you trim the sheet harder? There's only one reason. The wind Point higher. Oh, yeah. Aim higher into the wind. And why would you ease the sheet out? Okay. There's only one reason. Sail Not to sail lower. Maybe to sail lower. If it's really windy to sail lower, but there's a the reason you want to sail lower. Sail flatter. You want to go faster. Pretty simple. You ease the sail out because you want to go faster forward. But you give up some pointing ability to do that. So that's always the trade-off, right? So you trim it in to point higher and you ease it out to go faster. 
So what's correct? Well, depends on all these things. Depends a lot on your boat characteristics, depends on how good or bad the sail is, depends on what you're trying to do that day, depends on, okay, so what does wind speed got to do with it? When it's light air, what's your biggest problem? Getting the boat to move. get going fast enough. And um, we, we, we won't spend a lot of time talking about the underwater part of the boat, but uh, again, remember the sails, when they get trimmed in all the way, most of the pull is sideways, not forwards. Why doesn't the boat go in that direction? Keel. Because the keel and the rudder, the whole underbody thing, acts as a lifting force the other direction. It lifts to weather. The sails pull that way and the keel and the rudder pull that way. How do the keel and the rudder work? The keel is uh, symmetric, it better be symmetric, right? I mean, it's the same shape port and starboard. How does the keel create lift? Somebody said crabbing or angle of attack. It's a fancy way of saying the boat makes leeway. The boat doesn't go where you aim it, it goes sideways because the sails are pulling it that way. And because the boat's going a little bit sideways, the flow over the keel is asymmetric. So it's functionally as if it were asymmetric and ex accelerates the flow over the weather side of the keel as you're going that way. And that's what generates lift to weather. So it reduces the amount of leeway you make, right? So fundamentally, if you try to trim the sails really hard in really light air, and the boat's not going very fast, what happens? You go sideways. And until the boat picks up speed and then the keel and the rudder start to do their job, and then you get better. Okay, so that's, that's point A, right? If it's light air, you can't afford to trim the sheet very hard because you will just plain go sideways and not fast forward. So we ease it out in order to help get the boat going first. Um, I know Bill, Bill Gladstone teaches our North U things all the time, and he's, uh, his most famous saying is, speed first, then point. Always, you cannot try to point unless you have speed first. So that's the lesson here to start with. Okay, so in light air, uh, we're, gonna, we're not gonna trim the sheet very hard as the wind builds, what? Boat gets up to speed, we're gonna trim the sheet harder. How do we know how hard it is enough? Well, a whole lot of other, you know, it's a real world environment. You got other boats around, hopefully, and you got boat speed indicator, and you, if you had fancy instruments, you could read VMG and see whether it's beneficial or not. <coughs> but um, what I'm getting at is uh, it leads us into the next thing. Boat speed is super important. That if you trim the sail harder and harder, and the boat doesn't slow down, that's probably a good thing because it's helping you aim higher without slowing down. But if the boat starts getting slower and slower, then you gotta like put out a red flag, like mm, maybe this is over trimmed and the boat's, as we say, constipated because it's you're trying to jam stuff in too hard without having enough speed first. So the boat speed is a good thing. What does a water condition gotta do with it? Well, it's pretty obvious that when the water is flat, there's no waves to slow the boat down and you can afford to aim the boat higher into the wind without, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting over a sore throat here. I hope my throat may, I hope, it, hope it doesn't give out. <coughs> so when the water is flat, you can trim harder, and when the water is really lumpy, you know, we get a north breeze or a northwest breeze here in Michigan City, and some leftover waves, maybe the breeze was blowing hard yesterday and it's faded today. So now we still got waves left over from today, but not very much wind anymore. That's that's ugly, right? So we got more waves than wind, and that's a real problem for enough boat speed, and that is a sure sign that you would not want to trim the sheet so hard. Right? Okay, so uh, enough on the water conditions. So then what do I mean by the visual aid here? This is all of you should have some kind of a guideline for what is maximum pencil trim, like the hardest you're ever going to trim the sail on your boat. Telltales, right? Mm, okay, the answer. Somebody said something about telltale, so this opens up a whole other thing. Let, let, let's, I'm going to come back to that. That's not the right answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> the reason it's not the right answer is that how the telltales behave is nothing to do with the trimmer. That is not up to the trimmer. That's up to the driver. 
In the, okay, all right. In the, for the most part, that's up to the driver. Because if, if the sail is luffing, the driver should be heading off, bearing off. If the sail is stalled, which means the outside telltales are wiggling and wobbling, that means that you could be sailing higher and the hills are not to turn up. So your answer implied that if the sail is luffing, you should trim the sheet harder. Yeah, on a single hand boat, that's pretty much the same person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's sailing with all his friends all the time. <laughs> Guilty. Okay, but I, I think you get my point that um, no, you're right. trimming the sail in and out is one response. But if you're sailing the boat at the correct speed and the sail is trimmed in the right position, when the sail either luffs or stalls, the correct response is turning the boat, not changing the sail. Okay. So there's a lot more to it than just if it's luffing, trim it harder. If you're reaching, if you're not going upwind, then your answer is absolutely right. So those of you that do the reach, straight line reach or whatever, when the sail's luffing and you're aiming where you want to go, then yeah, then you trim it harder to keep it from luffing. Conversely, if it stalls, the outside string shows you it wants an E, so then you, you burp it out, right? Okay. But upwind, that's not necessarily the case. Upwind, we're trying to point as high as we can, and so if the telltale show you something, you probably need to turn the boat. <coughs> my, my thing here, uh, D, visual aid, is that all of you have, I think all of you have spreaders on the boat, and that's the single physical, biggest physical limitation. I mean, you can trim the sail until it hits the spreader. It's a gentle one. Yeah. Is that usually as hard as you should trim it? If, you're I don't think I really if the boat is designed perfectly, maybe so. But there are a lot of boats where the spreaders are really, really wide. A lot of cruising boats have old fashioned rigs where the spreaders are really, really wide. And ironically, if we could whack those spreaders with a hacksaw and make them six inches shorter, and trim the sail in six inches harder, that'd be a bonus. Yeah. At least in flat water, that'd be a bonus. I don't suggest that you guys are gonna do that because then <laughs> the mass warranty's off and all that, but um, <coughs> there are a number of boats that uh, do sail with this occasionally when it's, when it's perfect conditions to trim as hard as you can. They actually slam the sail right into the spreader and they poke, poke it into the spreader on purpose. For most of you, that's not correct, but on real high-pointing boats, it often is. The old IOR boats were famous for that. We used to just slam the sail into the rig all the time, often. Okay, so your visual aid generally will be, is it touching the spreader, is it two inches off the spreader, is it six inches off the spreader, or whatever. So that's, that's, that's what I mean by the visual reference. For those of you with the non-overlapping jibs, you, you don't have quite the same visual sign, but what you should do is have marks on the spreader because typically in, in when, it's, when the sail is trimmed as hard as it's gonna be trimmed, the leech is inside the spreader tip by some distance. I don't know if anybody, any MOM30 sailors here? Some of you used to have a MOM30 around here, yeah. Yeah, we used to, the spreaders were really wide and the boat was a high pointing, uh, a really efficient boat. We used to trim the, the leech of the jib was almost halfway in on the spreader. I mean, if the spreader was three feet, we would trim it like 16 inches in, long ways in. So as a useful visual guide, we put marks on the spreader so we know that's as far as we ever find it works. And so it's out two inches, it's out four inches from max, whatever, so. Okay, so trimming the sheet is the most important thing. Why do you trim it harder? To point faster, why do you ease it out? To, I'm sorry, to trim it in to point higher, you need to ease it out to go faster. It's that simple. And that's always the trade off upwind. Are you trying to go higher or are you trying to go faster? In a perfect world, you'd have both. Okay, so what else can we do with the jib here? Another important adjustment, the next one I've suggested here, is tension on the head stick. And there are a lot of different ways to get sag, but um, what does the sag do? Moves the draft. It basically makes the sail deeper, which makes it more powerful. And a, a secondary effect is it makes it deeper in the front, not the back, so that it makes it uh, curvier off the, off the luff, which makes it more draft forward looking. 
And the other thing it does that many people don't quite understand is it makes the top of the sail deeper a lot more than the bottom of the sail. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. So if you want it, let's see, I didn't start out by this, but um, no, we'll get to that in the next thing. Okay, so if you have your old-fashioned masthead boat with 150% Genoa, the amount of head stay saying you have is determined primarily by the backstay tension because that connects to the back of to the top of the mast at the same point. Yes, sir. Does uh, head stay sag more sag? Does that uh, induce more heel? Well, sure. And the fact that it gets the sail deeper and more powerful. Um, a secondary effect that I didn't mention is that when you sag the head stay, the whole sail kind of rotates around to lure behind the mast, behind the main, and so it actually helps tighten the leech up as well. And that's the part that does contribute to heel more than the front of the sail being deeper. Oh, so, you can't point us on. so, okay, so that's the trade-off, right? Why would you want to have more head stay sag? To have more power to help you go faster forward. Why would you want to have less head stay sag? Because it flattens the sail overall, but especially flattens the entry so that you can aim higher. The sail won't luff as quite as early and you'll be able to aim slightly higher. So it's a different way of saying the same thing, right? Okay. How much sag is correct? Well, enough to get the sail powerful, enough to give you enough juice, as we say. Uh, in the real world, for you guys have what, 30, 35 footers on average, right? For that size boat, um, you're never gonna have the head stay dead straight, but you're gonna have it pretty darn close. If, if it's windy and you have the rig just all boned up, you might be able to get it within an inch of being straight. And at the other extreme, when you have the rig really loose and you want as much sag as you're ever gonna have, six inches of sag is probably as much as is workable. What's wrong with having more than that? If you're sailing in flat water, you can get away with more, but anytime there's any kind of wave action and you have a lot of head stay sag, then every time the boat moves, the head stay just goes, wobbles around. And what does that do? Changes the sail shape dramatically every single wave, every single time. So that's generally lost energy and inefficient shape. So that's, that becomes the limiting factor is how loose can you go when it starts wobbling all over. That's negative. Okay. We'll spend a lot of time on the first slide there. Wow. So what else can we do with the sail? Other than the sheet in and out and changing the amount of sag in the head stay, we can move the car where we trim it. And we can move the car either forward or back, or we can move the car inboard and outboard. Okay, so moving the car forward does what? If you do nothing else with the sail but just put the car forward and leave the sheet and the head stay and everything else the same, it's obvious it makes the foot deeper, right? Yes. Foot, foot lays out against the lifelines more. What does it do to the top of the sail? <laughs> if you put the car forward, that moves the clue down and adds tension to the leech. So instead of the leech being curved vertically like this, it, 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 it straightens the leech up some. So when you tighten the upper leech in the sail, that actually makes the top of the sail deeper as well. So putting the car forward makes the sail deeper everywhere, top and bottom. So we call that a powering up move. That's adding power to the sail plant, to the amount of juice the sail generates. And conversely, putting the car back, it's obvious it flattens the foot, but it also opens the top. It reduces the amount of tension in the leech, opens the top. <laughs> And if you just want to do an experiment and you don't do anything else, leave the, leave the sheet tension the same and everything else the same. If you just slide your car back, watch the leech of the sail uh, relative to the spreader and it'll move away, right? And if you put the car forward, the leech will move in towards the spreader. So anyway, enough of that. So what's the right position for the car for and aft? <coughs> well, everybody knows the old rule of thumb is you want the telltale, you want the luff breaking evenly. So if you have like three sets of telltales, top, middle, and bottom, in a perfect world, aerodynamically, all three of those would, as the boat steers up or the wind goes forward, all three of them would start to show a luff at the same time. 
And as you bear off or the wind goes aft, all three of them would start to show so stall at the same time, right? Putting the car back does what? Trims the bottom of the sail relatively harder than the top. So if you put the car further back, how are the telltales gonna behave? <laughs> Top's gonna luff earlier than the bottom. Is that a good thing? In the real world, in most conditions, that is a good thing. And almost never do we live in the perfect world where the entire luff breaks evenly and all together. Um, conversely, if you put the car forward, what does that do? <coughs> Trims the top relatively harder than the bottom, and that would make the top not luff sooner than the bottom. If anything, it would make, we say it'd make the bottom stall. So if you try to steer the middle of the sail and you have the car too far forward, the foot's deep and the uh, bottom of the sail's gonna stall. So, <coughs> sorry, it's gonna luff. Um, it's a really stupid question. I'm really inexperienced. Where's what's where's the car? Okay, so the car uh, is the, on the track. Yeah. The car is the track that the sheet goes through before it goes to the clue of the sail. You know, the, on the side of the sailboat where I've got the, there's a rail so, that I never move it. It's got that cleat that we just always will leave there. You can slide that. Back. Sounds like your boat doesn't have an adjustable lead. <laughs> We never move it. We don't use it. It's frozen in time. Okay. I could, you know, I could be moving that up and down. Okay. So um, another. So so generally, moving the car forward, as I said, powers the sail up, and moving the car back, it, it flattens it and opens the top. So we could say that depowers the sail. It gets rid of some power. So in light air, you generally want the car further forward for more horsepower. And in heavy air, you generally want the car further back to get rid of its power, spill power at the top. So what's the range? How far do we move it? Well, in the real world, again, for your 35, 30 footer with a 150% genoa, the maximum range from all the way forward to all the way back might be a foot. 15 inches would be really extreme. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. You know, so it's a function of your foot length if you have the J105 jet that's only 10 feet long on the bottom, moving the car a foot is a huge difference on the sail. So your range of adjustment is gonna be a narrower band. And for these reasons, it's a, good, it's a good habit to have some marks on the deck, either the holes in the track or just plain marks on the deck for the back of the car or something so that you can keep track of where you are on your little scale. Okay, so how about moving the car inboard and outboard? <laughs> Okay, now the wind blows 20, how fast does the boat go? 4.82. Now it blows 25, how fast does the boat go? 4.7. Because there's waves and the sails are luffing and there's more drag, I mean, so you get the idea, right? That when the boats have a natural hull speed or a target speed, and when the wind is building in light air, you're struggling to go as fast as you can. But as soon as you have enough wind, the boat's going about as fast as it's gonna go, period. So when you get to that point, your goal is no longer to go faster, unless you're reaching in a different course, your goal is to go higher. Does that make sense? You're not gonna go faster, much faster. You're not gonna go enough faster. So instead, you should use that extra horsepower to try to point if you can. So that's point two here. That's always a trade-off between trying to flip fast, go maximize your speed forward, or to go higher. So to be in, okay, so in, in our 5, 12, and 20 knot examples, in, in 10 to 12 knots, when it's a perfect rule, everything's easy. Because you're going six knots, you're going as fast as you're gonna go, you're not yet tipped over, you don't have to luff the sails. How do you trim everything? In that condition, how do you trim everything? To be in what I would call point mode. You're trying to point as high as you can. So the sheet is where you start. The sheet's gonna be trimmed all the way in. And however you trim it on your boat, right? It's gonna be right to the spreader or whatever. Or on your spreader mark on the not overlapping jib, it's gonna be all the way in. What about the head state tension? Well, we don't need more horsepower. We're trying to point high, so we would probably have the rig pretty firm. So less head stay sag, however you do that, whether it's back stay or runners or rig tension or whatever. And then what about the car position? You want it back. 
But we wouldn't have it forward because that sacrifices pointing ability. You'd, you, you'd probably have it in the normal mode, and sort of in the middle, right? Because you don't want to lose power. If you have it back, what's wrong with having it back? You, you know, I said that helps you aim higher, it helps you point higher, but what's the negative? The, luff, the telltales don't work the same anymore, and you're luffing the top of the sail prematurely to the bottom. So if, if it's not windy enough and you put the car too far back, you're giving away some horsepower. And I'm saying it's only blowing 10, we're not overpowered yet, so we don't want to, it's too early to give away horsepower. So, so that, my answer is you probably have the car in the medium position, not back yet. <coughs> okay, so we're, we're sailing along in that 10 knot thing and we're in point mode with all that stuff done. We have a lull and the wind goes down to five. What's the first thing we do? Ease the, Ease the sheet. Because your helmsman wants to bear off and you can't bear off without easing the sheet. And you want to not slow down so much. Okay, just easing the sheet, what else do you have to do with it? Well, well, I don't know if I answer, finished answering this. I said, does easing the sheet make the sail fuller or flatter? And the answer is fuller down low, but, it's, but, it makes, but it makes it twist too much. You're opening the top, if you just ease the sheet, so you have to compensate. If you're gonna sail with the sheet eased some, you gotta compensate by putting the car forward a little bit. Okay, so that's all the same stuff we've kind of reviewed already. We're sailing along in 10 and we get a puff to 20. What's the first thing we do? Tighten the sheet. Ease the sheet. Move the car back. Ooh. Well, again, what's the most important adjustment that gets played all the time? The sheet. What do you do with the sheet? When it goes from 10 knots, when we're comfortable but high pointing, to all of a sudden a puff of 20. Easy. Easy. Tighten. Ease it. What's wrong with tightening it more? It's a whole new idea here, but when it gets windy, the helmsman only has one job. Steer the heel angle. And the harder you trim the sails, forces the helmsman to steer higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if it's blowing 20, that means a lot of the sails are luffing and there's probably <laughs> waves in your face and you <coughs> go slow. So it's ironic, maybe. In a perfect world blowing 10, you got the trim here to trim the sail trimmed as hard as it's gonna be, in less area you ease it, and in more wind you ease it. Okay? But you do it for the same reason. In both cases, you need to go faster or avoid going slower, however you want to say it. Okay? Enough of that? All right, so this is a sort of a same stuff we've already talked about some. But the, me the medium air is when it's easy because the boat goes as fast as it's going to go. And we're not worried about being tipping over and being overpowered yet. And the water condition is okay. So the last question here is a new question. I know uh, Rich Corbett donated the J24. It has a Genoa and it has a Jib. And they change, pick a number, 15 knots, 12 knots, 12 knots, say 12 knots. In less than 12, the Genoa is the right sail. And in more than 12, the Jib's the right sail. So if it's blowing 15, which sail are you gonna put up? The jib, fine, it's easy. If it's blowing eight, which sail are you gonna put up? The general, that's easy. Today it's blowing 12, which sail are you gonna put up? General. Well, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up a little bit. Is the general a roller or what? Sorry? Is it a roller furling jet? No, 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 this is a race boat with a main jet. But it doesn't matter if they're furling or not. You, you gotta put up a big sail or a little sail. How do you decide? Well, first of all, let's review how this trim would feel, how the boat would feel and what you would do to trim. If it's blowing 12 and I'm the aggressive guy and I say, let's keep the big sail up, what do we got to do? Boat's going to be marginally overpowered and all the trim steps are sailing as if we're overpowered, right? So you're going to have the rig hard, you're not going to be able to trim the sheet super hard probably, <coughs> and you're going to have the car back from normal. <coughs> If instead uh, we decide to be conservative and put up a little sail when it's blowing 12, the boat feels anemic, doesn't have enough juice. You need to, so we need to do the opposite. We need to power up. So you need to, in your mind, pretend that there's less than less wind than there is because you don't have enough sail. So 
J105 in light air, that's why you've got that deep jib, because without it, you've got to go so loose on the rig, you go to it's all wiggly wobbly and goofy. <laughs> so, okay, so enough of that. I'm going to run through a whole bunch of pictures, which I uh, hope that you in the back can see. Uh, some of them I'm just going to talk about what the seal looks like to me and what I think it's good for. And then a bunch of them we're actually going to make an adjustment to the, either the head stay sag or the sheet tension or the car position or something, and you'll be able to see the obvious differences. So uh, first of all, you all ought to be aware that um, the sail shape horizontally is what we're looking for most of the time. Vertical shape is a different subject, which we'll spend a couple minutes on. Uh, in all of our sails, and I think it's become a kind of a industry standard, we put draft stripes a quarter of the way up, halfway up, and three quarters up. So that's what we got here, these three stripes. And we can actually scan and digitize them, and, or I can simply old fashioned put pins in a ruler and measure them or whatever. Uh, and we can arrive at uh, some numerical measure of how deep or flat or full or twisted or whatever all this sail is, right? Uh, we talked about uh, not only the cross-sectional shape, how deep, or, how deep or how flat, where the draft is forward or back. Uh, we also can talk about, again, twist, how much the rotation of those three stripes changes. And the last thing is the head stay sag. Uh, somebody in the back won't be able to see this, but the purple line here is the straight line. So the amount of sag we have in the middle here is that measure. Okay, and... Oh, you know the sheep? The shape of that camber or that airfoil like that, like uh, what what part of that uh, has the most uh, uh, lift or whatever? The the sh the tighter of the of the camber or the the longer of the camber. He's the scientist getting all screwed up. Is it air, 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 air force. <laughs> uh, the only answer I have given you so far is there's more wind at the top. And the twist makes the direction of pull of the top part more beneficial, right? So those two things alone ought to tell you that when you're the sail trimmer, you should pay more attention to what happens at the top of the sail than in the bottom. I don't know how else to answer you other than that way. Does that, does that help? Okay, so we take a sail picture and we, sorry, you take the picture and send it to us and we scan it. And we give you this back. Well, is this useful? I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, the, the secret is, at, at the bottom stripe, the camber happens to be 12% of the distance from the front to the back. At the middle stripe, it's basically 15%, and at the top, it's 14 Well, okay, if that help you? I don't know. When, when you spend more time and want to learn more about this, you can. So we could talk about that. So here, I'm just going illustrate, to illustrate a few important ideas. Um, many racing boats have more than one number one, and this happens to be a Benetton 40.7. So they have two number ones. They have a real deep light one for light air. It's sort of pre-powered up. It's built that way. And they have a lot flatter and twisted and more open leached heavy number one. So it's built depowered for the top end of the range. You know, the number one is a sail you use from near zero to, I mean, you don't need to get a smaller sail until it blows 14. 20 apparent, at least 20 apparent. And the boat feels way different in five true than in 12 true. And that's why it's beneficial to have two different shapes. So I'm sure I'd love to sell you more sails, but this is an illustration of sail trim and sail shape and understanding how they work. So here's the deep light one. And there's the flatter, more draft forward, open leached, heavy one. So I think, I think it's fairly obvious how different they look. And if you were hung up on the numbers and wanted to know what the camber numbers were, the light one is about a 15 or 16 percent deep sail, and the heavy one is more like a 12 percent deep sail. So all right. So here's another. I don't know if you can see the stripes really well, but this is about as deep a sail that we've ever made. So that's a really, really, really powerful sail. It's good for light air. But if you, if this was your only sail on a roller furler, it'd be fine, light air and reaching. But oh my God, it would be pretty bad as soon as you get windy enough that the main is luffing and you want to start reefing the sail. Just so help you help you visualize what we're talking about. 
This is a sister ship, another Santa Cruz 70, and this is the other end of the scale. This is about a sail that's absolutely as flat as we've ever built. So this is a number two that's intended for enough wind where the main is absolutely flat and you on your ear and you, anyway, so, and not only is it flat, but it's also twisted, meaning the top of the sail is open. Com compare that to this again, where the top of the sail is not open. We say the leech is closed on this one. It's open on that one. Okay. Uh, this is an example of a, a little boat I used to spend a lot of time on, the S279. There might even still be one around here, I don't know. Um, but this is a, an example of a 26 foot boat that weighs close to 5,000 pounds, it only has a 30 foot mast, it has a lifting keel, which is frankly not very sexy. Um, so the boat needs horsepower because it's heavy and under rigged, but it can't handle too much horsepower because the keel won't let it. It's not, it doesn't, right? So it's a kind of a, this is our problem as sailmakers to make the right sail shape for the boat. But um, this is a pretty deep sail, but it's also pretty flat in the back. So at each of these stripes, we've got a, this is just a little hash mark that happens to be at halfway front to back. That doesn't mean that's where the draft should be. That's just halfway as a reference. And just look at the, that section of the sail from there to the back. There's almost no shape in it. It's a little, but very little. So that's, that's the part of the sail that allows us to trim, this, trim the leech right up to the spreader without backwinding the main, dragging it sideways and making the boat go slow. So, again, if in that vein, this is a kind of a lighter picture, if it gets a little bit windier, what would we try to do to make the sail perform better? We'd keep the head stay tight, but we would also, I said the higher tension, that may be one of the less important things, but when you put the halyard on harder, what does it do? It makes the front a little rounder, but the beneficial good effect for more breeze is it makes the back even flatter. So the fact that there is a little curvature in this section, if we were to sail in more wind with more iron, we would, one of the goals, we would be trying to flatten that part out so that we could trim the sail right up to the spreader without tipping the boat over still. This is a similar size boat. It's a little uh, uh, Laser 28, but it's quite a bit different. It's about half the weight. It has a tiny little keel. So the sail is flatter overall, and it's more twisted. It's built with more twist in it. And so again, these are just ideas to help you sort of illustrate the, the concepts we're talking about. I'm gonna skip over this, I got a million of these. So this is a, an extreme shape, again, showing how flat the back half can and should be on many of your sails. And this is a, this boat actually has a pretty efficient keel and a narrow shroud base, so they try to point pretty high. And with a wide overlapping genoa, the only way to make that work is by having the back of the sail quite flat. So this one is, you know, especially, I don't know if you can see the top stripe, but it's absolutely straight from there to there at the top. And that's the key to being able, again, the key to being able to trim it under. So here's the cruiser class. This is a Swan 40, but it, or no, I'm sorry, this is a Sabre 42. But this is uh, an all-purpose furling sail, and the boat is heavy, and they sail in light air on Wednesdays, and so we need a lot of horsepower to get the boat started with. But it's also open enough in the back that it'll, it'll work when the wind comes up. And it also has a reefing pad in the front. I don't know if you can see that extra rope in the front. So that helps it when it's, uh, when it's furled up part way. I'm gonna keep moving on here. We've got uh, okay, so here's a couple of, um, we're going to do a comparisons with the same sail, just trimmed a little bit differently. So how do we get the entry flat? What adjustments do we do to get the entry flat like this? A, we have the head stay pretty straight, no sag. And B, we leave the iron loose, right? Because less loft tension lets the draft go back and that's flattening the front. So, so this where the sail number is, for example, there's very little curvature in that section. That's what I'm looking at. There's the same sail with the head stay looser and the higher tighter. So you can see an obvious character difference. The front, look, look at the front three or four feet off the head stay. Quite a bit different. 
And what part of the seal changes the most? My answer is going to be? Well, the front, sure. What else? The top. Why is that? If you compare these two, the, the very bottom stripe in the foreground, it changes, but not that dramatically. But look at the top stripe. That changes a ton. Why is that? In, in this picture, we got maybe six inches of sag, meaning at this middle stripe, it sags it's six inches from a straight line. Fancy word, catenary. That means at the top quarter, it sags about four inches, and at the bottom stripe, it sags about four inches. Well, down here where the sail's 15 feet wide, four inches is something, but <coughs> up here where the sail's only four feet wide, four inches makes a huge impact. So it's just because the sail's triangular, the sail gets narrower up high, the same amount of sag does way, has a way, way, way bigger effect. So this is another reason why the sail trimmers, I should focus on the upper sections of the sail more than the lower sections, okay? Oh, I'm gonna skip over some of these. So. How's that sale look to you? Bill Martin, you need a new one. Why? Why did you need a new one? That is really ugly. Why is it so ugly? Come on, you guys know. Curvature and back. Yeah, it's way, way too draft aft, right? It's flat. It's it, 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 it's this section is fairly flat. This section is fairly round. So. Uh, remember I was talking about from this middle thing to the back, how that should be in, for most boats and most applications pretty straight. It's not. It's quite a bit rough. Does he need so, a new one or can this... Well, okay. So if he didn't buy a new yeah. one and we got a sale with this boat, this, this sale this afternoon, what are we going to do to make it better than this? I was thinking I would send it to you like I do every two years anyhow. You guys okay. clean and Okay, that doesn't solve the problem today. How are we going to make this go better? How are we going to make this go better today using this sail? Because it's the sail we got to use today. Well, the first thing, the first and most obvious thing, the problem is the sail's too draft aft. It's too round and back. It's too tight leached. It's too draft. So we would try to break the iron winch. Try to break the iron. You need more and more and more left tension. Right. That's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I would say because the sh because the back end is too round, you can't afford to trim it right up to the spreaders anymore because that's just plain slow. So we're going to wind up just giving away some sheet tension. We're not going to be able to trim it quite as hard, and we're going to give away some pointing. Both of those things, more iron and less sheet, give away some pointing. So that's a sure sign when a sail doesn't work very well is you have trouble to point with it. Um, what else would you do? How about head stay sag? That's a that's a complicated question because the sail is generally too deep overall, so you'd want more sag, but the, I mean you'd want more head stay tension, less sag. But the problem with that is it's also too draft aft, and tightening the head stay is going to make it even flatter in the front. So. That uh, depends on how much whether you need more power or not. What do you do with the car? Uh, okay, that was I should have said that too. Yes. Yeah. So what? When it gets draft aft, the real problem with the sail is the whole leech is too tight and round. It's into the main and it's curving around the spreaders. So how would you move the car to help that problem? You move it back because moving it forward pulls down on the leech and makes it even tighter. So that's correct. You would probably try to experiment with the car back to help open the back end. Good question. So far we've only talked about uh, horizontal shape in sails, uh, other than I mentioned twist, but um, you will, you should be aware of and look at the vertical curvature in the sails as well. Um, in super high point mode, we try to make these sails as straight as we can vertically and fit the rig. Um, there's another one that uh, I'm just gonna sh show a couple here. So if you have more than one spreader, that's a perfect visual aid to see the balance and whether it comes into one spreader sooner than another. Um, when you trim sails, 
you can you can increase or decrease the amount of twist, right? If you if you ease the sheet, I said it has more twist, and if you put the car back, it has more twist. But you cannot on the boat you cannot change the the way the twist is distributed in the sail. That's our problem. We have to build it so that it the so that the balance is correct from top to bottom, and. And I'm mentioning this because a lot of you do have two spreader rigs, and this is a useful thing to look for as the sails get older, or if it's not right to start with. It's a really bad sign if the sail is further off the bottom spreader than it is off the top spreader. Because when a sail is new, we want it to vertically look like this. Kind of like an upside down J. We want it to be straight and right next to the bottom spreader, and then stay more open at the top. So it looks like that. And as sails get old, or if they're built with an incorrect vertical distribution of shape, they look more like that. And that's what's happening with this sail. It's further off the bottom spreader than off the top. And so you might be able to do a little bit to trim it better, but basically it's a sign the sail is tired and needs some help. So here's the other example. I said the upside down J thing. So this is a it's a peculiar kind of boat that needed a peculiar sail, so this is extreme. But that's uh, when the sail is built, flatter down low and deeper up high, and it opens correctly like this, right? You don't get that, right? It's way open at the top and quite straight vertically. Another visual aid, even if you only have one spreader, another visual aid when the sail's trimmed and shaped correctly is that the lower half of the leech should pretty much should be vertical and pretty much parallel the the shroud down here. And if, and if it doesn't parallel the shroud and it sags away to lure, that means the leech separates or sags away relative to the thing. That's a bad sign. And again, that's, it's not a trim factor so much as a sailmate's health factor. Yes, sir. Does, does the rig tension, the, the, the sag of the mast, play a part there? Um, I think you all heard the question. It has a rig tuning question. Uh, not really. The, the twist that's built into the sail is kind of the way it is. If the rig's way out of whack, it may give you a different visual sign that might be misleading. But I, we'll, I, don't, I don't know if we have time to do that, but uh, we'll get to that. Okay, so um, I talked about uh, how hard you trim a sail, and on the non overlapping jibs, we put marks on the spreader. So here's a target 10. I don't know. I'm sorry. I guess you can't see it very well. But there are some, this is a black spreader with some white, three little white tape marks on it here. So that's the trimmer's visual aid to see whether it's trimmed correctly or not. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to move on here. Um, we've talked a fair amount about head stay sag. And I don't recommend that you want to go to the front of the boat and look at the head stay sag during the race. <laughs> But for sure, your trimmers ought to be aware of how much sag there is, and they ought to know because before the race, between the race, after the race, when the sails are trimmed, you ought to go to the head stay, walk up to the front of the boat, and take a look and see what, the, see what it is. And again, when we're talking about head stay sag, how much you have, um, again, it has, there's three draft strikes, and so the middle one right here intersects the luff right there. So what we're talking about is visualize a straight line from here down to the bottom at that point in the luff of what is that distance. And a lot of you have a, uh, this has hanks, it has a two inch Dacron tape and a one and a half inch hank. So that's a three and a half inch thing. That's a good unit of measure, sort of visually see, you know, is it one of those, two of those? Uh, a lot of you that have regular foils of love tape, same thing. It's a two and a half or two inch uh, piece of tape. And so that's a good way to get, get your vision and how much sag you have. So here's a little J88. Uh, we've got the sail trim kind of normal to go upwind. And again, you can see the white stripes on the spreaders as our trim guide. Um, so this is how the sail looks sort of normal upwind mode. We do nothing else but ease the backstay, so we got a lot much more sag. Haven't changed anything. That's all I did. Just dumped the backstay off. What did it do to the shape? Knuckle forward, we'd say, right? It's way, way, way curvy. All three stripes are way curvy right off the headstay. Is that a good thing? 
That looks pretty extreme to me. I don't think there's ever a condition you'd want it that draft forward. So say we had been, we were really sailing and the wind had been nice and comfortable at 10 and then it went to crap and it went down to five knots and we eased the backstay like I've just done here. What else would we do to make the sail look better again? He's a halyard, right? So that is something to remember that every time you change the amount of sag, it changes the draft position. Now maybe you want to change the draft position, but not this much. And so you usually will compensate by adjusting the love tension as well as the amount of sag at the same time. Right, I'm just pretty obvious again. Luff is, the head stay is tight there and the curve off the Luff is normal looking. There it's really, really curvy forward. Yes, sir. Could you just back it up again? The... So that's kind of normal looking, upwind trim. That's how it would want to look. That's pretty extreme where you've got a lot of sag and, and still too much halyard. So you'd want to ease the halyard to make this look. It would, the end result, if we were to ease the halyard there, and I'm sorry, I don't have another picture. If we were to ease the halyard there, it would look, the character of the shape would be more like the first picture. Let's say it would just be deeper overall. <coughs> and therefore more powerful. If you had uh, light winds and light, <coughs> a lot of chop, would you want to, something like that? Yeah, I don't know if everybody heard the question that um, when it's the worst time to sail, when it's the least fun, is when it's light and lumpy. And there's more waves than wind. And that's when you need, A, you can't afford to try to point high, and you need to maximize the horsepower to try to get the boat moving forward. And yes, that's the time you would want the maximum amount of headstay sag, and probably not trim the sheet very hard. But my point in this picture is, I don't think it's, there's no condition where you want the sail that draft forward. The, the, I, this would be better by using the high a little bit. Compared to the overall shape, you think the leech is a little tight high on that one? Well, I did say that earlier, if somebody remember that, that when you increase the sag, it does, the whole sail does rotate around behind the main, around the lure a little bit, and it tightens the leech up. Yeah, that's what you're seeing. Okay. So here we've got another, this one is a, a, a typical good looking upwind shape where it's curvy forward but not extreme and it's really nice and straight in the back so you can trim it right in tight. Again, we got a, uh, you can't see it very well, but there's a mark right here, that's max trim right there. And so it's trimmed about as hard as it's ever gonna be trimmed. So here's the same sail, same exercise again, we got more sag. We just let loosen the rig up, either the backstay or the shrouds, I don't know which. So that's the same sail, nothing different, except it has more sag, right? So it's deeper overall and deep, but especially deeper forward. So here's another example, um, another Sydney 8. We're gonna go two different sails on the same boat. This is a light air sail that's got a lot of horsepower built into it. And the next sail is a heavier sail that has very little built into it. So that's a deep, powerful jib. Oops, I'm sorry, I got the wrong, uh, I got the wrong sequence here. Well, I have one somewhere. So that's a, that's a pretty powerful looking sail for light to medium air. Okay, so here's another, Another medium jib, it's about the same size and same wind speed as that last picture. What do you think about this one? Looks pretty tired. It's another one that looks pretty lousy. And why is that? Because it's draft aft and tight leached. It's the same way we looked at that Santa Cruz 70 general that I said was tired, and you're Bill Martin needs a new one. Same deal here. This sail is just as round in the back third as it is in the front third. That's death. <laughs> and it's not going to go fast. Even at the bottom stripe, where there's a, a batten here, you can see that bottom batten even stands up, so the lower leech is pretty tight. That's all That's all bad. Okay. There's the opposite, right? That sails way draft forward, but I wouldn't say it's too extreme. This happens to be a heavier sail. But uh, again, <laughs> from these middle stripes to the leech, there is nothing in there. They're dead straight. And that's, again, that's the key to being able to trim the sheet hard without slowing the boat down. Okay. You can also see there's actually some wrinkles in the front. So it isn't draft forward because you got the iron cranked that hard. It's because it's built that way. So that's on purpose. That's a good thing. Uh, 
I've said in several times now that the upper sections of the sail are most important. Um, I don't know if you can see, but on the little J70 jib here, there are actually, you know, like on your main, you put telltales on the battens on the leech of the main. This, this sail has three telltales here, and that's there to help show the same thing. If we were to trim the sail too hard, what would, happen? What would it show us? Those strings would stall, they would disappear around the back. We would no longer have attached flow off the leech, and that's a sure sign that the sail is trimmed too hard for the conditions. So those are useful. So again, this is the, the, the idea here is, the reason those telltales are there is because the trimmers are paying most of the attention to what happens up top. And uh, so that's a, a useful guide to know, just like a main when it's over trimmed, okay? Some of you have old sails that um, could or should be recut, but I'm gonna suggest a really cheap and easy thing to do to them is if they have battens, and this is even more true of mainsails, just plain put stiffer battens in them. That kind of artificially makes them flatter. Most Dacron sails for sure, the, the problem is they, you know, it's an anatomical problem. We all get fatter in the middle here. So, and, uh, so st stiffer battens uh, are cheap and easy and effective solution for that. So we just put a stiff batten in the top and it didn't improve the middle of the sail, but it sure did improve the top of the sail. It helped open up the top and allowed us to trim the sheet a little longer. All right, so there, there's a heavy air sail on the <coughs> Sydney 38. I'm gonna skip that. Um, we talked at, at the very start about not only putting the car forward and backwards, but also putting the car inboard and outboard. And realistically, most of you don't. You have a track that's next to the house and that's where you trim it, period, until you go reaching and then you go outboard, right? But uh, a lot of modern boats have in-haulers. So they actually move the jib sheet inboard and outboard by pulling on something that pulls it further inboard. So this is a J88 and this illustrates <coughs> what's going on here. So again, we got these three white stripes here and that's our max trim and you can see that the track the track is way out here outside the house but we got the clue of the sail pulled with a thing that goes this way so it's way inside the handrail here right. when would it be good to inhaul the sail that much why would you do it once again you want to point higher and the right conditions to point high are we've said it in a couple times already. Medium air, not maybe not super light air, but enough air that the boat is already sailing at speed and the keel is doing its thing. And flat water. So you know, when the boat's at speed and flat water, not overpowered, that's when you'd want to trim the sail in the hardest, both against the spreader with sheet, but also by pulling the clue for the other boat. So So here's the same boat with a heavier sail, so, you know, sailing a lot more breeze. And there is some in the tracks out here, so it is still in hole, but the, we've got it outside the grab rail, whereas that other lighter air sail was inside the grab rail. There's, there's the grab rail on this one, so it's, it's inside further. Anyway, you get the idea. On boats like this, it's really, it's a key thing to be able to mark the inhalers so you know where you are same as you mark the spreaders and other things so in this case we actually were learning the boat so we drew and, and I calculated it six degrees seven degrees eight degrees nine degrees off center line and so so you can see in inboard is that way this is outboard this is the track out on the deck so that's how far in it came and um, remember that light air shot when the sail was trimmed inside the grab rail, it was about seven and a half degrees. That's pretty tight. Pretty tight. Your Hunter 33, the track is probably at 12 or 13 off center line. The way that is. So there you go. Here's an extreme example. Modern TP52 in the Med Cup. Look at that. Where's the jib trim? Holy crap. The distance from the mast. <laughs> The distance from the mast to the clue there is about 15 inches on a 52 foot boat. Crazy. This does not work unless you got a keel and sail shapes that allow it to work. So here's the here's the reminder. <laughs> All right. So 
if you're on this boat, mm -hmm. how do you trim the sails? <laughs> not as tight and not as far inboard, right? Because the boat will just go sideways if you try that. So, there you have it. Um, just again, uh, reinforce that it's a really nice idea to mark everything. I talked about marking the spreaders, I talked about marking the inhaulers, but it's also really nice to mark your cars for moving it inboard and back. Um, again, what you know, the range is on this J88, the range is only four inches, three, four inches from all the way forward to all the way back because it's a little boat with a little short foot jib. But on the Michella, what the difference between all the way forward and all the way back on the Genoa is probably a foot or 15 inches at least. Yet. So, having some reference marks helps you, uh, especially in a anyway, I'm gonna skip on some of this stuff. I think uh, I, I can sense that we've done lots of here already, right? And um, maybe I'll just illustrate a couple more ideas here with Hensel's. This this is a sail. I went I started sailing with this guy, and um, that looks fine, right? It's not out of whack vertically. What about here? I guess you got to pay extra to get shape in it. I don't know if you can see, maybe you can't see it very well, but these seams in the front half have absolutely nothing. <coughs> so in order to make the sail work better on the boat, what would we do? To try to induce more shape in the front, we would? Oh, yeah. A, we'd sag the head stay, yeah, and B, probably try more higher tension, right? So here's the problem. When I took that picture, we already had that much head stay set. <laughs> so if you hold the head stay tight, this sail, we'd say inside out. It'd be like no shape whatsoever like that. So this, again, I'm not picking on this sail. I'm, this is a perfect illustration to help you guys understand what works, what doesn't work. And if you have something that looks like this, hopefully it rings a bell. What about that one? How do you fix that one? With your checkbook, sir. <laughs> that, that's uh, beyond, beyond its uh, useful life, for sure. And why is that? It's obvious, because it's way, way, way draft down. Again, that's the, the, the general aging problem with almost all sails, is they get deeper overall, but they particularly get deeper in the back. They get more draft down, so that's all bad. So, you know, recut might help it some, but generally it's, uh, so there's, there's the opposite. There's a high performance, high pointing boat that wants the sheep trim really hard. And it's exactly the opposite, right? Pretty draft forward, but absolutely nothing in the back two thirds of the sail. Dead and it's flat. All right. I'm gonna quit there because we've been at this long enough, right? You guys have since we're, I, I could spend the same amount of time talking about